next to Superman and Batman. Spider-Man could be considered in the holy trinity of comic book superheroes. These three are no strangers to having multiple film incarnations getting rebooted every few years. Superman getting his start in 1978, Batman 1989, and finally Spider-Man in 2002? Sure, Batman took 11 years to get his film after Superman, but Batman was still one of the first superheroes to get a movie at all. By 2002, you already had X-Men, Blade, Spawn, Steel, Supergirl, The Phantom, and Howard the Duck. Even The Punisher and Captain America got their direct-to-video movies in 1989 and 1990. So looking at that list, it makes you wonder, how did Spider-Man not have a movie by that point? I mean, he was Marvel's biggest IP. Why was he not first in line? That's what DC did with Superman, obviously. So why not him? Well, it wasn't from a lack of trying. Spider-Man has quite a complicated history when it comes to getting past just the writing room itself. And that's what I'm going to inform you about today. This is going to take a minute though, because Hollywood is a hot mess of corporate greed, lawyers, too much, and also not enough cocaine. So stick around for unfulfilled movie deals, bankruptcy, and a surprise interference from a secret agent across the pond. This is the history of Spider-Man in film. The first appearance of Spider-Man in movie form wasn't actually by a studio. It was actually made by an independent filmmaker, Donald F. Glutt, who directed and starred as the webhead himself. So Spider-Man's first experience on the big screen, or in this case, most likely smaller screen, was actually a fan film. Mixing live action, stop motion animation, and a blow up Spider-Man doll, the film may be cheap, but considering the time, it might be one of the most charming and honestly impressive fan films out there. Glut even created his own original villain known as Dr. Lightning, who definitely is not like Dr. Doom, so stop thinking that. I highly suggest checking it out just to see it for yourself. I got bad news for you. Your father's dead, but you're safe, and so is the world. Moving on to Spider-Man's first licensed live-action movie, CBS's Spider-Man, directed by E.W. Schwackhammer. They don't make names like they used to. Look at you, Brixton. This made-for-TV movie was actually used as a pilot episode for the 1977 Spider-Man TV show starring Nicholas Hammond. The show ran for two seasons, but was cancelled due to it being too expensive for CBS to keep making it. Although the show was popular, it just wasn't enough to turn a profit the studio desired. Interestingly enough though, in the US the show is just that, an episodic TV show. But in other parts of the world, mainly Europe and Australia, the show was never syndicated, but instead edited into theatrically released films. The first two episodes of the first season were put together and released as Spider-Man Strikes Back in 1978, and the last two episodes of the second season were titled Spider-Man The Dragon's Challenge in 1979. Which means, technically speaking, in places outside the United States, this is the first Spider-Man trilogy nearly 30 years before Sam Raimi ever did it. But this is where things would take a turn for the worse. Spider-Man would enter movie limbo, or as it's better known, developmental hell. By the early 80s, superhero movies were just starting out, the only well-known series at that time was the Superman trilogy. Soon to be quartet, because we just like to test how far we can go to break people. Superman almost killed the franchise as quickly as he started it though. In 1983, Superman 3 was released, and let's just say people didn't like it. It's really fucking stupid. Stupid and boring. Bad combination. Like the man said, people were starting to get tired of Superman, and if this was the direction the series was going in, can you blame them? At least they fixed him. Eventually. One day. Maybe? Anyway, Spider-Man. Plenty of people wanted to make the next big superhero movie, including producer Roger Corman. Even though he never got the chance to make a Spider-Man film, don't feel too bad for him. He eventually got to make another Marvel superhero movie in the Fantastic Four. Look! Uh. Okay. Oh, my 
Hmm. Let's move on. The year was 1985. DeLoreans were the car of the future. Nintendo released their first home console. Whoa, nice graphic! DC's Crisis on Infinite Earths hit comic book store shelves, and artists came together to sing the hunger out of Africa. On top of all that, Canon Films paid Marvel Comics $225,000. That's only $500,000 in today's money for a five-year contract to own the film rights to Spider-Man. So back then, comic book companies didn't make their own movies. Because, well, they made comic books. So either filmmakers, or they themselves, would go to studios and have them make the movie for them. The Spider-Man project was given a budget of about 15 million, possibly up to 20 million dollars. There was a big issue. You see, Canon Films had a bad habit of splitting production budgets across multiple film projects they were working on at one time. So sure, maybe Spider-Man did have a 15 million dollar budget. But, say they had a movie that only had a $2 million budget. So, they would take a little bit of money from Spider-Man, put it towards that film. Kind of scummy in and of itself, the problem arises once you have a lot of different movies being produced at one time. Then, you realize you took too much out of one movie's budget, so then you just add some back using another project's budget. Obviously, this cycle continues until you have all your films looking cheaper than they have any right to be. So, Spider-Man's budget was cut to nearly $7 million, less than half of when it started. But, where did that money go? Well, it gave you such great superhero classics, such as Masters of the Universe and Superman 4 The Quest for Peace. God damn it, Superman. Although Spider Man wasn't going to be as big as the original plan was, they still had a contract to fulfill, and some director names were even thrown around. Toby Hooper, director of Texas Chainsaw Massacre and Poltergeist, was first in line. He was later replaced by Joseph Zito, director of Friday the 13th, Part 4, and Invasion USA. Clearly, quality was a priority at Canon. Then it came to casting Spider-Man himself. Stuntman Scott Leva, who actually posed as Spider-Man in some live-action comic book covers, was talked about but never confirmed. Whispers of Tom Cruise are rumored about, Stan Lee even expressed wanting to play J. Joan Jameson, with the budget being cut and the casting not even being set in stone, somehow the writing was the messiest part of all. Executives at Canon, Menachem Golan and Yoram Globus, uh, they knew nothing about the character. Menachem's understanding was that it was a spider, man. Spider-Man was a person who turned into a spider, like, like a, a, a werewolf uh, turns into a wolf. Eight-armed, hairy creature, and he, of course, is suicidal because he looks so awful, and the mad doctor who changed him into it has this basement full of mutants somewhere, and he's going to take over the world. It was dreadful. Writer Leslie Stevens drew up the first draft that was immediately shut down by Stan Lee. Ted Newsom and John Bracado were brought in to replace Stevens, and their script actually kind of mirrors elements from Spider-Man 2. The good one. Barney Cohen was hired by Menahem Golan to do his second draft of the new script. Then, Golan himself had some touch-ups. Touch-ups by a man who still had no idea who Spider-Man was as a character. The project did start to fall apart, though. Joseph Zito quit after some disagreements with Canon. On top of losing the director, the studio kept adding more and more rewrites from people like Shepard Goldman, Don Michael Paul, Ethan Wiley, and Albert Pyun, who was put in the director's chair. And if you want to know how the script was coming along, here's a quote from Scott Leva himself. There had been so much hubbub going on, some of it from Stan, some of it from Menachem, and I think they kept switching writers around. And, and Joe's idea was that it went from good to okay to bad to worse. Can's money problems caught up to them, and Spider-Man was shelved and eventually Can Films was bought by Giancarlo Peretti, who renamed it Pate Communications, no relation to the French studio Pate. Menachem Golan left the company, and with Peretti's permission, Golan took the film rights of Spider-Man to another film studio by the name of 21st Century Film Corporation. Do you remember that Captain America direct-to-video movie I mentioned earlier? You can thank Golan for that. Because alongside Spider-Man's film rights, he brought good old Captain America's film licensing with him too. For better or for worse, only one of these movies made it to production. Mr. President! Thanks. I want to say for worse? But could you imagine that kind of Spider-Man? Do you want to imagine that kind of Spider-Man? With the change in companies, Golan was able to get an extension on his contract, 
up to 1992, so he had a bit more time, but money was still an issue. So how did 21st Century get a budget? Well, they split their film rights with three different media companies. Coco Pictures would get the theatrical rights, Viacom would handle television distribution, and home video release would be dubbed by Columbia Pictures, with Stephen Herrick attached as director. Golan would take the screenplay from Canon and have the credits to Barney Cohen, Ted Knutson, John Bracado, and Joseph Goldman. Although no changes were made since the last draft was written up in Canon, he wanted the script to seem more updated, so he just slapped a 1989 copyright date on it and would try selling it to different studios. Eventually, some would ask for a rewrite before they'd buy it, so he hired Frank Lalagia and Neil Ruthenberg, each revising the script themselves. Columbia Pictures saw the new scripts essentially the same as before, but decided to make a deal. A report published in Variety claimed that Carrico had a full script written up by James Cameron. In reality, the only full script with Cameron's name on it was just another updated Golan script from earlier with a different copyright date. However, Cameron was writing a story for Spider-Man, even though it wasn't a full script. In 1991, Cameron gave Carol Coe what he called a scriptment. So for those of you who don't know, a treatment is like a plot outline and just kind of like the themes of the movie written down, not very long, a few pages usually, and that's to kind of help the writer write the full script, which has the dialogue and the screen direction and all the little details that you get in a full screenplay. But when James Cameron would write his movies, uh, he would write his treatments, but they'd be noticeably like more detailed and longer than a normal treatment. So he coined the term scriptment because like a script, it did have moments of like scene direction and dialogue and really laid out and detailed sequences and scenes. But then there'd be other parts of it where it's just like a treatment. It just kind of goes oh, and then these events happen, and these scenes kind of play out, and this is the theme we're going with, and this is what it's trying to tell visually, and this is like the moral we're going for. And with that, because it's not a full treatment, because it's way too long to just be a treatment, but it's definitely not a full script because not everything is written out, scriptment. And with that knowledge, let's get back to the video that was definitely not recorded weeks apart from this. James Cameron's Spider-Man actually had some buzz going on about it. Interestingly enough, it had quite an influence on what would eventually be the first Spider-Man movie. Some parts you may recognize are Mary Jane as a love interest, Peter feeling sick and having a crazy fever dream after being bit, learning he can see without his glasses in the mirror, ditching school to learn about his powers, tracking down Uncle Ben's killer in an old warehouse, and one of the possible influences where organic webs were used. There are some notable changes too. Peter's character was much more aloof and held strong disdain for his fellow classmates. He basically had a holier-than-thou kind of mindset that would mature over the course of the film. Instead of the radioactive spider biting him, the lab the class goes to was doing studies on radioactive flies. The missing fly ends up getting eaten by the spider that later bites Peter. Instead of a wrestling event, he becomes a street performer and eventually gets on late-night variety shows. The villains are pretty interesting as well. Although Electro is used as the main villain, He's not an electrician named Max Dillon, but a former thug, now multi-millionaire, named Carlton Strand. Electro's right-hand man is Sandman, but also not going by his original name Flint Marco, but simply Boyd. The tone is much darker than what we're used to seeing in Spider-Man movies, and deals with some pretty hard stuff, including an intimate scene with Peter and MJ on the Brooklyn Bridge, with like weird spider-related pillow talk. It wasn't great, but it wasn't that bad. Sure, some things definitely need to be changed around, but with a little time, I'm sure we could have gotten a pretty interesting take on the wall crawler. But guess what? That didn't happen. Why? Here's why. Carol Co. pulled the plug on Cameron's Spider-Man in 1992 due to lack of funds and legal issues. The studio then got another extension with Marvel up to 1996. So let's jump forward four more years. The year was 1996. I was blessed upon this earth. Independence Day was making its way to the highest grossing film of the year. The Great Comics Crash had Marvel file for bankruptcy. And both Carolco Pictures and Golan's 21st Century Films went bankrupt as well. But a little known company by the name of MGM came along and saved what was left of 21st Century and absorbed the company, while Carolco Pictures faded away. This absorption gave MGM the rights to Spider-Man due to Golan's deal with Marvel Comics, along with all the scripts that had been written up to this point. 
Now you may be asking yourself, how did Marvel save itself from closing its doors forever? Firstly, they merged with Toy Biz to create merchandise. The companies coming together created Marvel Enterprises. They helped Marvel dust themselves off and pull together some much needed money. Secondly, the better known outcome of Marvel's bankruptcy was that they basically went door to door selling their film rights to any studio who'd say yes. 20th Century Fox obtained the X-Men, Fantastic Four, and Deadpool. Universal got Hulk. Guys like Ghost Rider, Daredevil, Punisher, and others got juggled around until eventually returning to Marvel. But what we're here to focus on is Spider-Man, who is given to Sony. Also, I feel like I should bring this up now. At some point in the 1990s, according to Stan Lee, Michael Jackson actually tried to buy a Marvel comic so he could star in his very own Spider-Man movie, and felt that this was the easiest way to do it. Funnily enough, this isn't the first time Sony had Spider-Man's film rights in some form. Remember back when 21st Century split Spider-Man's rights into three different companies? The studio in charge with home video distribution was Columbia Pictures, who was bought by Sony in 1989. So now Sony not only had home video licensing, but the whole shebang. So now, after 20 years in limbo, we can finally get underway with the Spider-Man film, right? No! Were you not listening to me a minute ago? MGM is still claiming they have the rights to Spider-Man due to their absorption of 21st century and all IP they had ownership of. So what now? Well, an unlikely hero will help figure this out. The year was 1958. America and the Soviet Union are shooting satellites around the Earth. The hula hoop is swinging around millions of gyrating kids. Doctors still thought that shoving an ice pick into your face would uncrazy you. And most importantly, Ian Fleming wanted to make a James Bond movie. For those of you who don't know, Ian Fleming was the author of the 007 book series. And by this point, he had just published his sixth book, Dr. No. <coughs> <coughs> so he called up his friend Ivar Bryce and a man named Kevin McClory. He asked them to take one of his books and bring it to the silver screen. McClory decided against adapting any Fleming's novels, whether it was not liking the stories themselves or wanting to do something original, McClory still wanted to use the character of James Bond. So with the help of Jack Winningham, the duo buckled down and began to write. Fleming told his writers that in producing the film, he would take no profit himself and all the rights would go to McClory and Winningham. At some point, Ian Fleming and Ivar Bryce got together and discussed kicking McClory out of the project and stripping away all of his Bond film rights. You know, the rights that Fleming gave him and already discussed he himself not wanting any of the profit that came from this. Then Fleming took the screenplay McClory and Winningham were working on in 1959, later to be known as Thunderball, and novelized it with him having 100% of the writing credit on the book published in 1961. The book copied the screenplay you hired two other people to write, you penis. So, McClory and Winningham took his career hanging self to court and sued. Then, over the course of three weeks, Ivar Bryce eventually was able to convince them to settle out of court due to Ian Fleming's declining health. Fleming would have full rights to the novel, though with the side note of based on the screen treatment by Kevin McClory, Jack Winningham, and Ian Fleming, in that order. McClory got the literary and film rights to Thunderball. The deal also made Fleming have to make the following statements, quote, the novel reproduces a substantial part of the copywritten material and film scripts. The novel makes use of a substantial number of incidents and material in the film scripts. And there's a general similarity of the story of the novel and the story as set out in said film scripts." End quote. McClory then made a 10-year deal with Eon Productions. In 1965, Thunderball was released into theaters with all three men given story writing credits in that very specific order. However, only Kevin McClory is named producer. So at this point, you're probably wondering, why did we just have a detour of a completely unrelated movie series for the last two minutes? Well, this one incident, 40 years before where we left Spider-Man, completely changes everything and is basically why Sony ended up getting Spider-Man. So, let's catch back up to him. In the time we passed over from 1965 to 1998, Eon Productions have become a subsidiary of MGM, which means all Bond films are now owned by them, except one. You see, that court settlement gave Kevin McClory sole film rights to Thunderball specifically. So even though Eon Productions made a Thunderball movie, that 10 year deal he made with them was long gone. McClory still owns the story itself. In fact, Warner Brothers adapted Thunderball into Never Say Never Again in 1983, while Eon released their own Bond film Octopussy that very same year. So again, what does this have to do with Spider-Man? Former MGM executive John Kelly left and took the knowledge he had of Thunderball's tricky film rights to Columbia Pictures, basically telling them, if you guys can get the film rights from Kevin McClory and adapt Thunderball, 
you guys could just start making your own Bond franchise and not have to worry about Eon or MGM. The studios had reached an impasse. Both Sony and MGM had arguable reasons to owning Spider-Man and 007. MGM wanted to take Sony's Bond film rights away from them due to the fact that that's their main moneymaker of a series and any form of competition could hurt their earnings. And Sony wanted to take MGM's Spider-Man film rights away from them because they didn't have a series at all to work with and saw Spider-Man as a perfect fit. The companies went to court and ended up cutting a deal. Columbia relinquished their rights to James Bond, while MGM forfeited over Spider-Man. In the process, Columbia received all scripts and treatments that had been collected for the last 20 years, and finally, Spider-Man entered pre-production. <laughs>